Today, we're unlocking the full potential of pandas for financial analysis. We're going to look into correlations between assets, compare average returns versus volatility, and we'll look into other types of risk metrics. All this with the mindset of conducting a thorough analysis as if we were trying to find the best asset to invest in. So we're in for a lot of pandas indeed, and Matplotlib for our charts. And we will be using cryptocurrencies as our case study. Just to be clear though, this is a educational course. So nothing I do or say should be interpreted as financial advice. And also for you to be comfortable with what we're going to go through today, I highly recommend you have at least seen the previous two chapters of this course. Whether you have watched the videos or had a look at it on our written course on our website, it's all for free. The links are in the description below. So you know the basics about pandas and Matplotlib. Anyways, let's get going. First things first, let's create a new Jupyter notebook. So I'll just call it chapter. And the extension is IPYNB for Jupyter Notebook. And there we go, we have it. So I did say we would work with a practical example today and using cryptocurrencies. So for that, we need to download this, the, those market data. So you can come here on the website and click here and you'll get to our GitHub where we've stored everything. And you can see that we'll be actually working with 10 cryptocurrencies market. We'll be analyzing deeply the market of each of these cryptocurrencies. So here you see, for example, ADA, that's Cardano, but here BTC, that's Bitcoin, ETH, Ethereum, etc. So there's 10 of them, you see them here. So rather than downloading each of them by hand, I would just suggest you come here and just do download the whole code and then copy this and copy the files in your working folder. But let's have a look at how it looks, maybe the Bitcoin. And okay, it's a bit too large to see it, but you can always come on raw here. And as I said, this is a CSV file. So you see that we have a heaps of data. So this is really the Bitcoin market. And in there, we have several columns. Actually, let's have a look at them in the in visual code. So if I, you can see that I've already put them in my folder. So if we open BTC, for example, I've used a, I have a little package to color CSV file. Let me just point it out. We've seen it in a previous, um, chapter it was called what was it called rainbow csv so if you need you can search it in extensions and install it anyway so i was talking about this this csv file here so we have six columns the first is a date so this date is in milliseconds we'll have to convert it in an intelligible date we'll see that and then we have well basically all this really represents the standard way of describing a market in finance. So we, we, what we call this is the, is OHLCV data. So the first, we said first column is the date, but then what we have the open. So that's the value, the price of the asset at the opening of a given trading session. If it's a, it could be a daily trading session, you could be looking at a, a hourly trading. So hourly candles, minute candles, etc. So opening, open, open price at the beginning of the trading session. High, well, what is the lowest value that was attained during that trading session? The low, same thing for the lowest value attained. And close, what is the closing value of that trading session? And finally, the volume. So basically, how many coins were exchanged during that trading session? Great. So this is what the files, how they look. And obviously, the point to that we, I mean, what we need to do now is to actually load them in our code so we can deal, analyze, play with them nicely. Okay, so the first thing we want to do as with any beginning of a code is to import the packages we'll be using in this code today. So let me simply come here on the website and copy them so I don't have to write it down and then I'll run the cell. So as usual, we'll be using our good old pandas to do all our data analysis, um, importing the files in the code and the cleaning, et cetera, and the analysis. Okay. So here then two well-known plotting libraries in Python, the matplotlib and Seaborn, which we have also seen recently. Okay. So now the point is to load all these data into some variables so we can deal with them. 
So probably a good thing we can do is have a list of the names of each of these coins. So we can do a for loop to load all these files in some data frames, in dictionaries, et cetera. So let me simply come here on the website and copy this so I don't have to write it down myself and it'll be faster. So there we go. We have our crypto list. So these are the 10 cryptos we'll be analyzing today. ADA is Cardano, BCH is Bitcoin Cash, while BNB is the Binance Smart Chain coin, BTC Bitcoin, ETC the Ethereum Classic, while ETH is Ethereum the standard Ethereum, LINK is the Chainlink coin, LTC you might know it is the Litecoin, and XLM is Stellar, while EXRP is the Ripple coin. Okay, so I mentioned dictionaries. What we're going to do is right now I will define an empty dictionary. And in this dictionary, we will store all the data frames of each of these coins data. So for that, we'll do a for loop. So I'll do for crypto in, well, crypto list. There we go. And maybe first thing I should do in here is simply do a little print, print of crypto, just to check that everything coincides properly. And there we go. It all works nicely. ADA, et cetera, et cetera, XRP. Great. So now what we want to do is well, create the keys in the dictionary and put the values that we want in them. So I'll do df list. Probably the name of the keys, it makes sense to just put crypto, crypto directly in here. And then here we need to read the CSV, load the CSV. And this is done, I think we've seen that before with the PD, so PD for pandas, and then the, the method is read CSV. So let me simply put that here and paste it so I'll I don't make any mistake. So you can see that what we're using here is a F string. So because the point here is that you realize when you look at this, that what, how these files are named, they're named using the symbol of the cryptocurrency that we're looking into, and then USDT. So that means that the market we're looking is the market of the ADA USDT pair in this case. So it's always all these names of the cryptocurrency files, market files, always the symbol of the crypto with this little symbol here and then followed by USDT. So I'm simply saying put the crypto name that we have in here and then the rest of the name of the file is always this symbol usdt.csv. Great. So if I run that, probably we still see our print, but I can start doing um looking at them. So if I do df 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 list of let's say ADA, ADA, beg your pardon, and we just do that, what will we see? We do see that we have a nice pandas data frame with all the data in there. If we did ETH, for example, you can see that this will also give us the ETH, the corresponding ETH um, dictionary. Nice, but nice, not quite actually. If you look at this here, the date that we see is not intelligible at all. This is actually the date of that trading session counted in many seconds since 1970. This is a standard convention. But for us, it's not really helping us, right? As humans, we don't understand what this is. So what I'd like to do is convert this into something that we understand. And at the same time, let's actually use the date as the index and remove this numbered index here and use the date because this will help us a lot to do some and some filtering across dates later. So for that, we should simply add those two lines in our little for loop. So let me do that. We come here, I'll come and add them. And there we go. So first line here is the conversion of the date into from milliseconds into something we can understand. I think we've seen that before. So we're using the pandas to date time method. And what I'm saying is that the new date column should be the old date column, but transform that into a intelligible date and telling him that what it is at the moment is a value in milliseconds. Then the other line that I add is, is now say, well, actually treat the date column as the index column. So remove that previous column, that index column, and make the date, the date, beg your pardon, the index column. So let's run this, and then let's run this again, and you can see now we have everything nicely. So we have the date here, and by the way, as you can see, it starts from 
the in 2017 and what we have is that each line is the the candle of every hour so that was at four and then you have five six so the trading sessions the candles that we're considering here are one hour so that's why we have a huge data file we have a, more than 50,000 rows. So can you imagine this, the price, the market of Ethereum since 2017? So that's a lot. I think if we check Bitcoin, it would start around the same time nicely. But for some more recent cryptos, like let's say for ADA, for example, then this, I think we have a slightly less. Let's start a bit before. Now with any beginning of a data analysis, what we what is generally recommended to do and what we've seen in the past is that you need to look whether your data is clean or not, if it has some dodgy values, things like that. So that you would have to deal with before actually starting a proper and a deep data analysis of, of that data. So we've seen that one good way to start with is to use this describe method of pandas. So when you run that, you get a data frame that gives you some first-hand statistics about the data that you're dealing with. So for example, you have the count here. Oh, I wanted to do BTC, maybe because that's more what you know anyways. So you can see that the count here, good thing, all the columns have the same number of entries. So at least we don't have some missing values in certain columns. Um, from a first hand glance, glance like this, I don't think I see anything striking, but we do get some nice statistical information. For example, we see that the max price Bitcoin has ever had is six, exactly $69,000. And the minimum in our data set is around 2,800. And that corresponds to the price at the end of the 2017 bear market. And Across all these years that we're, counter, we're counting in our data here, so for BTC was up, was uh, starting in 2017. So around these three years, we can see that the min, the minim, the mean price, beg your pardon, is around twenty thousand dollars. So that's quite interesting. You can see how the evolution is quite huge between this three thousand here, sixty nine thousand here, and a mean around twenty thousand. Okay. So that's that. Another thing we should check now is whether we have some dupl duplicate dates. Because sometimes, you know, when the data is stored with by your whatever algorithm is storing this data, some mistakes can happen. So a good thing is to check whether we don't have several entries of the same date, because that would be a problem we would have to deal with. So for this, we're going to be using a method that is Go, we'll have to do index here, index, and then here is uniqueness. Let me unique, n unique, n unique. So count to count um, the unique things. So, okay. So we see that this, well, and that's what I was saying, beg your pardon, to count all the unique entries. And we should probably compare that simply to the length of a column. So, you probably already know it because that's not the number we were getting when we did the count on our um, data frame. But let me put it back again here. So we can see that in terms of unique dat dates that we have, well, actually unique index. So that's why we one reason why we put the date as an in our our index so we could use that. So in terms of unique index, therefore of unique dates, we have fifty one thousand three hundred and eighty three. But now if I count the length of the rows of our data frame, I have 51,409. So basically we have a discrepancy of around 26. So that means we have 26 dupl duplicate, beg your pardon, I'm having a hard time pronouncing today, duplicate dates. So that is indeed a problem for our analysis. So the first thing we need to do is to actually spot well, where these duplicates are so we can then remove them from the from the data frame so for that we will be using so actually let me do call it duplicated data and yes so so that will be the part the data frame of the duplicated data so i'm using again it's a, it's a thing we can do thanks to the index and then we this is simply the method is called duplicated so let me actually do that 
duplicated like this. And in here, which one should we keep? So which one do we want to see? The first of the duplicate or the last, etc. Well, we'll go for last. So I'm just going to put keep last. So this is how this looks like. So let me do duplicated data so we can simply see it appearing directly. So let's do that. And what we what what comes out of this is simply an array with false. So possibly we also have some trues here. So basically it's a list that tells us for each row we have either a false, whether that's a du duplicate or it has a duplicate, or a true. So how do we now use that to spot exactly in the data frame where this is? Well, we use the something we've already seen before, which is simply the df lock so we should do df list of let me put it here df list of location of well the duplicated data so let's do that and let's see what comes out of this nice so we have so this should be i think 26 rows and we see all the duplicated data that we have here okay so what we want to do is we don't want to deal with this we want to deal with the whole data frame minus with this taken out of the data frame so for that we'll be using um a little symbol so let me simply do that now what we want is that df list of btc is going to be df list of bdc minus in between quotation mark the duplicated data so for that we simply put here duplicated data and before we have to put a little tilde. So there we go. So if I run this, it worked fine. But what we can do is to check that everything that it did indeed what we wanted to this to do is to run this and see indeed now we indeed have the total length of the BTC data frame is the exact same number, same length as the unique that we had before. So that means we indeed removed the duplicates. Great. So we don't want to do all of this by hand for a whole all our data frames here. So I suggest we simply do a little copy of this and come put it in here and put it at that point here. And indeed, we don't here. We we want to use the crypto variable that's scanning through the list. So I'm simply going to put crypto here, crypto here as well, crypto here as well, crypto here as well. Great. So I can now run this and then I'll just simply, well, we could run everything. We won't see any much difference. Um, we can do that here. We can do that here. And we can see that we still, we indeed have the two same numbers. Let's check for another cryptocurrency to see that it, if it indeed worked for other cryptocurrencies. So for ADA, same number. Great. Okay. Let's do one more test. Ethereum, ETH. Let's do that. ETH. Okay. And there we go. Same numbers. So that's great. We remove all the duplicated data. Great. Our data is now ready and clean. So we can get serious with today's tasks, which is the analysis and comparison of these markets. The first thing I suggest we do to start our analysis is to actually regroup the data on our coins in the same data frame. It'll help us I mean, it will make the comparison and all the things that we want to do much easier. So I'll simply create first a empty data frame. So I'll do a little PD data frame. So I'm, that's, I'm creating an empty data frame. And then what we're going to do is that we want to scan through our dictionaries that contains all the, the data data frames of each coins. So I'll do for crypto in our dictionary, which we had called DF list. And remember, when you do this and you do a for loop and you use you scan through this df list like this, the values that what crypto this variable will take is the, the keys of the dictionary. So since the keys of the dictionary was the name of each cryptocurrency, that's why when I do this print here, we have our, our these names coming out here. Great. So what I want to say now is that in this new data frame, I'm going to put the name of each column is going to be the name of our crypto like this. And then from there for each column, I'm going to go fetch a specific column of the data that we had in 
our DF list, so in all these files. So what I should do, so DF list is a dictionary, so I need to go fetch the right key. So the right key for the column ADA, I want to fetch the dictionary what the values that are in the keys ADA. And then what we'll be doing is that we will today focus on the closing value of the market. So you could do, we could do the analysis with the open, high, low, etc. But today to simplify things, we're going to focus on close and that's more than enough already. Okay, so if we do that, I can simply run it and I have a error. What have I done wrong? I know this is simply that I forgot when I'm defining an empty data frame, I should have put the parenthesis here. So let's go. There we go. So we haven't printed anything yet. That, that's what's inside. So let's do now. Let's do D, DF of ADA, for example. And we should find now just a series. Oh, this this one that I should be running. Beg your pardon. So now we just have the a column here in, in for ADA, which makes sense. But if I print the whole data frame, we see that we now indeed have all our closing values for each cryptocurrencies that we're considering. Okay, great. There's something that does come up and we have some nouns here. So noun is not a number. And why we have that? Well, because indeed we, we saw that earlier is that some of the cryptocurrencies were not listed or didn't exist at, at exactly at the same time, start exactly at the same time on the exchange where we got this data. So for example, on the, on, at this date, ADA was already, was already on the market, but BCH wasn't, etc. So I suggest that we, we, that's going to be a problem because we want to be able to compare the market. So if we have nouns in the middle, this is going to, not going to be um, good for us. So I simply suggest that we drop the, the lines where we have nouns. So for that, we simply use the method, the data frame method called drop NA. So if I run this, now we do see that we, so we have indeed lost, I'm not sure. I think we were at 40,000 rows just before. I don't remember exactly. So now that I dropped that, you can see that it starts maybe two years later. So the beginning, the first line is now two years later. So now we're down to 31,000 rows, but at least now we can compare things nicely. So we've reduced the range of our analysis, but now we, uh, we are going to be able to do that analysis because we'll be able to compare nicely all these coins here. Great. So why don't we get a little picture, uh, a picture of what these prices, how they look like across time. So let's do a, a, a little plot that'll make things more telling for us. Let me actually come on the website and I'll just copy these lines and then we can put them here I'll undo the end end here. And then instead of column here, what I'll, well, we should have a look at is BTC. So let's simply do BTC and then I'll run this and we should see a nice plot of the evolution of the BTC price. And indeed, if you're familiar with this, you might, you might spot some, some typical events. This was the, COVID crash here, and then the big bull run that happened in two stages in 2021. And then here, the big bear market that we've, that we've went through after this bull run. And now this little, how do you say, rebound that we are living through these days since the beginning of 2023. Great. So that's a nice Bitcoin chart, evolution of the Bitcoin. But I mean, we did all this work to to, to regroup all these, uh, these, these coins, so we might as well plot all of them. So let me go back to having column here. So I'll then add an indentation here. So, oh, beg your pardon. So we can then add a for loop. So let's do for, so column in df dot columns, because we want to scan through the columns of this data frame. And then we finish with a column symbol. And if we do that, and if we run, we can see that all the plots were created one after the other. So this started with ADA. And you can see that, I mean, all the cryptocurrencies, some of them do have very different, different evolutions. So Bitcoin is this one. ETC, you see quite different. But now if you start looking, ETH and BTC, much, much, I mean, closer. The difference is much closer, etc. 
So this is quite interesting. And I think this I'm hinting to what we should look into now is indeed looking at the correlation between the prices of the of these cryptocurrencies. So how do we do that? Well, here, guys, we, I'm going to show you one of the true powers of pandas. And we simply do this. Behold the power of pandas. Bam. Done. And that, that took not, that didn't take even one second. And I remind you that we have a data set or data frame, if you want. I'm scrolling too slowly. <laughs> Anyways, that is 10 columns where each rows, there's more than 31 thousand there's more than 31,000 rows and this computation of computing a correlation between each cryptocurrencies took less than 0, 0.0 something seconds and that's really astonishing the reason why this can be so so fast is because pandas uses a library called numpy and numpy is a library that does matrix computation so when you start doing um like we do a lot in general to for pedagogical purposes or because we don't have a, a choice. When you start doing for loops and things like that to scan through data, through tables, etc. Python is quite slow. But Python, when you ask it to do to handle matrices and multiply and divide and multiply and do inverts, beg your pardon, and things like that of matrices, it's actually quite fast. And that's what NumPy does. So pandas uses this NumPy library very efficiently, and that's why it's able to do a computation like this so fast. Okay, what can we see? Well, well, first of all, you see like a correlation matrix is actually mathematically asymmetrical um, matrix. So that's why these numbers across the diagonal will be the same. In the middle, we have a one that makes a lot of sense. The correlation between ADA with ADA is one. And what other things can we see? Well, we see that the correlations do vary. Uh, in general, it's quite high. You see most of them, I think, are, if not all of them, are above 0.5. You see, for example, um, what can we say? Actually, you know what? We don't see, it's not that easy to analyze this like that. So we might as well plot this correlation matrix. And what we'll do, we'll use the Seaborn library. And let me fetch this these lines directly so I can do that faster. So there, there we have it. So let me just explain what's going on. We're actually not using, we're actually using the Seaborn um, library. So that's the alias we defined right at the beginning. Let me just show you that. Import Seaborn, Seaborn as SNS. Great. And, and here, so we're not actually doing a plot, we're doing a subplot, but that doesn't really matter. Here I define the size of the plot, so the size will be big enough for us to see. And the type of plot that we're doing is a heat map. You'll understand when we plot it. And actually, first of all, let me not bother with lock here and just do the plot of what we showed here. So DF cor 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 so DF correlation. So we are plotting exactly that. And this is just to have the annotations. So let's simply run this. And there we go. We have a nice plot of the correlations between our cryptocurrencies. So, and basically with this heat map, so you do get the, the feeling here where the higher in heat in between quotation marks, the higher is the correlation, while the lower, so the darker, the colder, if you want, the lower the correlation is. And actually, we see I wasn't quite right. The smallest correlation that we have is 0.43, and that's between BNB and B Bitcoin Cash. But all the others, you have a lot. There's a few, okay, 0.43 here, 0.55. But you do see some places where there's a very high correlation. And as I was mentioning it, um, ETH and BDC are quite well known to be correlated, and you have a 0.93. Um, correlation between all of them. So great. So that is valuable information. Um, we could go even further. So I had put a dot lock here. And for example, this is maybe, this is an hour, another power of pandas because we put our date as an index. Now let's say I want to study the 2020 correlation, 2022 correlation. So the correlation of these coins only 
along the 2022 um, um, date. Now, actually, I think I wanted to show you the 2020 because what we see here, that's the, the reason is because we see some negative correlations that appear, which means they're kind of anti-correlated. For example, this means that when BNB, um, the BNB's price increases, well, it seems that the ETDC price decreases. Admit, let me add a little caveat to this. Generally, when we're studying the price, the correlation between assets, we don't actually look at the price. Because if you look at the correlation of the price directly, what it's telling you is that if two, if, uh, well, if two assets are on average growing, well, they will have a strong correlation. But we want a more detailed information. Since we have a data that gives us the price at each every hour, so in every one hour candle on the market of our cryptocurrencies, what we really want to know is if during an hour ETH grew, did BTC grew, grow as well? And so we want to have that more precise correlation information between the, the currencies. So what we are doing is that we don't want to study the correlation on the price, but we want to study the correlation of the evolution of the price. So for this, we will use the function PCT change that we've already seen before in a previous chapter. So we will say that DF PCT is DF of P and we'll use the method called DF PCT change. So let me just actually display this and you can see that I, we still have some nouns going through here. So actually that means I made a little mistake. Well, actually I didn't do something correctly. And I believe I know what I did. And it's that when I did the drop none, I, I should have, this just, that doesn't save this modification in our data frame. So you should do either DF equal DF drop none. So now our, our, our new data frame is the one where we've um, removed the, the, the NAs. Or there's also the keyword in place equal true that you can put. But anyways, so let me run this. Actually, I'll run everything at the same time. So we'll see that now we'll get to something, yes, that makes sense. So indeed, the, still, the, the, the first line, you still have some nouns. That makes a lot of sense because what this PCT change does, it computes the percent change of the, the, the value with respect to the previous value. So the first line, there's no previous to do the computation with, so that's why we have a noun. But then, everything works fine. So for example, what we, what this value here tells us that the closing price of ADA between this date here at 10 o'clock and the closing price at 11 o'clock underwent a 0.6% increase. And then you see here the next time it was a decrease, etc. So that's great. So now, now that we've done that, we can do a nice correlation plot using this PCT change. So let me just simply copy this here, paste it here, I mean, and what we'll do is in here, instead we will put the DFPCT instead of our um, DF. So let's do that, and then I'll run this again, and now we have a new heat map. And what we see is that indeed, because as I was telling you, on average, all our cryptocurrencies were growing, so that's why when we were only considering the price, we were having something with high correl correlation. But now when we are correlating really the evolution on each hour, the evolution of the price, we have a, a lower heat map in general. And I think the smallest correlation that I see, for example, is 0.59 between we have BNB and XRP, the same with ETC, etc. But the highest, surprising or not, um, the highest that we have is between ETH and BTC, which could have been expected if you're familiar with, with cryptocurrencies. As I was saying, these are quite well known to be, BTC, to be correlated. So the way you understand this is that in general, for each evolution, for each hour, in general, when BTC increases in price, there's a high probability that ETH will also increase in its price. Great. But be careful when I said that the correlation decreased, that is true. The, the, the map in general is slightly lower. 
But those are by no means small correlations. As I said, I think the minimum is 0.59. So this is really telling us that in general, the, all these cryptocurrencies are really well correlated and that's valuable information. I think we get, would get even more insights on what these numbers represent if we actually did some plots of the evolution of the price across time. So we can compare, we could do some over, over plot two currencies and see how correlated they look. So let's do that. Allow me to simply copy this code and now come here and put it, it'll be faster. So let me run it. We'll comment the, the graph first, and then I'll tell you about what's written here. So this is a plot of the price of Bitcoin and the price of Ethereum on the year 2023. So be careful here. You can see that each have their own scale. So the Ethereum scale is re represented here. It's corresponding to the red plot, while Bitcoin is the blue and the axis is here. So what do we see? Well, we do see a pretty strong correlation, right? It does look like a lot, these curves do kind of overlap a lot. Even, for example, pay attention to this region here where like, it's almost like the blue line is hidden basically behind the red. You can't really distinguish the red and the blue behind. You have some periods where it's a bit less and et cetera. Be careful though, it's these, because of the different axes, it doesn't mean that the Bitcoin at this point here has practically the same price as Ethereum. No, what is telling us this overlapping is telling us that the, they are very comparable, the evolution in amplitude with respect to each, uh, each scale. So just bear that in mind. Um, so the plot, in terms of the plot, how did we do this? Maybe you, you're, getting, we, we, you're getting accustomed to, to matplotlib, but so here we're initializing the plot if you want, and here, I'm selecting the data that I'm plotting. So here I did a selection with DF plot on 2023, but we could have plotted the full, um, the full range. So let me just put these two dots. So we plot the full range and you can see that now we're starting from 2020. And for example, we do see that the first couple of years, first year or so, the Bitcoin and Ethereum were quite different. In, in other words, the bull run of 2021, you can see that it started with quite a lag for Ethereum as compared to Bitcoin. But then when it got to here, you see that they started following each other quite a lot. And also nowadays we're back into a region where the correlation between the two is very high. Okay, cool. So, so that was the full range. Thanks to this lock, we could do a, a lot. So for example, if we, we said we wanted to do from 2022 onwards, I could also simply put this and you'll see that now I have the plot for from starting at 2022 onwards until the end of the data. Okay, cool. So then here the asset choosing what we want to plot, both the assets. Then so the important thing here to just realize is because we are setting two different axes. So that's why I have this fig comma x. And then the first axis I'm defining here. So simply doing the plot saying the data index that is for the x axis axis, beg your pardon, the abscissa. And this is now I'm giving the ordinates, so the y axis with, so for asset one, giving it a color, setting a nice label, setting some tick parameters, tick params. And important thing here, I'm saying, I'm going to create another um, x axis, but we will be sharing the abscissa. So two different y axes, but the same abscissa. So that's why you have this x2 is equal to the x twin x, x beg your pardon. Anyways, and then same thing, but defining the second axis. So that's why I have at this point axis two, because I defined it here. Great. So that's that. Let's have a look, I think, at a, so that was a, 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 a illustration of something that had a very high correlation on our heat map, ETH, BTC, 0.85. That was the largest that we had here. So let's actually have a look at a coin that's quite different, that, that's not as correlated at all, XRP and Bitcoin Cash. And we'll come here and we'll do XRP and we said Bitcoin Cash, so BCH. Okay, let's run that. Let's actually run it for the full period or let's actually run it for 2000, simply for 2023, for this year. Okay, let's run this. And you can see that indeed now things are 
quite different. We do have quite a higher correlation at the, at the, the first three months, let's say. But then here, the correlation seems to be completely lost. And especially here, here around the recent explosion of the Bitcoin cash. So let's actually look at, you know, let's have a look at the, the, this correlation when we choose for, for this, 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 this beginning where the correlation was quite high. Let's see how much we get if we select this. So we'll do the first three months. So we'll do got lock. I want to do lock. I want to do from 2023-01. Oh, oh, again, I forgot the these these little things. And we're saying 2023, and I'm forgetting it again, um, until 03. And let's see what we get. So we were looking at BCH XRP. So we see that the correlation, okay, is average around 0.54. But now let's have a look at this region where is correlation is really lost. So from, let's say, okay, let's say April until the end of the data set. So we'll go 2023-04 onwards. Let's run this. And there we go. You see now BCH XRP, we're down to 0.37 which does coincide well with what we're seeing here. Great. Just a little short salesman's break, if you'll allow me. The best way to support us is to, of course, subscribe to our channel, Robot Traders, but also to share this course, which we give for absolutely free, with anybody who you might think will benefit from it. Now let's get back to this chapter. So we finished the discussion about the correlations. So let's move on to another pillar of market analysis. I'm sure you've heard of the concept risk reward, which is basically evaluating how much you can return for how big of a risk. Well, to look into this, I simply suggest that we look at a plot of the volatility versus the average returns. So let me come here and copy this piece of code, and then I'll explain what's in there. But again, let's do the plot first. So we see what we're dealing with here. So you can see I'm plotting the volatility versus the average return. And I've put an extra dashed line to represent the zero and zero axis. And we have all our cryptocurrencies that are shown in this plot. So where do they stand in, in terms of volatility versus average returns? And you can see that, for example, amongst all these, and beg your pardon, I should say, at this point here, I'm considering my full data set, not a special year yet. So I was saying amongst all our cryptocurrencies here, the one that has the lowest volatility, we can see that, for example, it is Bitcoin. Don't get me wrong. Cryptocurrencies are an asset with very high volatility in general. But we see that amongst this set, the one that has the lowest is Bitcoin. And on the contrary, I mean, not on the contrary, but another information that we get is that BNB, so the Binance Smart Chain coin, is the one that gave the highest return. So you do something I want to show is that you do have this kind of, you could imagine this law, this line that goes like this, which is a standard, something known in, in finance is that generally the highest return imply the highest rate. So the more you go, at the highest return, the more you'll get in terms of volatility. But so this is really a choice of each and every one to decide what is best for them and what they can deal with, etc. But I mean, for example, and your bank account, a savings account generally has a very low, well, it will have a few percent um, return per year. But what comes with that, the comfortness that comes with that is that the risks are practically minimum of minimal of using your losing your money. And on the other end of the scale, you have cryptocurrencies that can give you huge returns, but also imply a lot of risk. And typically we see here with the volatility, where we see, for example, that we have some very volatile coins like Link and ETC. So we do see that on the lower end of the volatility in this total sample, BTC stands out, Ethereum as well and BNB. So ideally, of course, you would want to be as low here towards this line and as high at, on that corner here. But yeah. So, okay. 
So I think, so we are spotting these nice things that Bitcoin is, doesn't give you the highest return, but on the contrary, and I mean, what you get with that is that it has the lowest volatility. Ethereum has slightly more volatility, but gives us a much higher average return. And BNB is even slightly more volatility, but then even higher return. Anyway, so let me just explain how we get to this plot. So you can see that I define the list for the mean return, so the average return, and a volatility list. So simply because we're going to compute the mean return for each coin and the volatility for each coin. And we're going to fill this up and then we do the plot of, of this list versus this list, volatility versus average return. So again, I've put temp data here so that we can play with the dates easily without having to change the variable in the plot that we have here. So I'll, we'll do that in a bit. We'll change a bit to see how things evolve. But let's finish with the discussion of how this works. Again, I define initialize my plot here, and then I do a loop. And as you can see, this loop is simply looping across the columns of our temp data. So temp data, what we are really looking into is our data frame of the percent change of the price of our cryptocurrency. So just note here that I'm doing DFPCT and not DF. Okay, so how am I then defining computing the mean return? Well, very simply, that is going to be the price of the given cryptocurrency. I take the average and I do a, a times 100 to get a percentage. And then the volatility here, well, instead, same kind of computation, but instead of being the mean, I'm taking the standard deviation. So that's how you generally define volatility, is what is the average spread of the price of an asset. So that's why we're taking the standard deviation. So what is the average spread around that mean here? And as you can see, then very easily, what I do is that I append this computation. So I then fill up my mean return list and volatility list because coal is going to take the values of each of the cryptocurrencies. Nice. Then what am I doing? Adding a bit of configuration so that the plot looks nice. I'm saying for each cryptocurrencies, well, on the dot, just put the, a text where the text is going to be the name. So column, the column what is taking here is going to be the name of the cryptocurrency. So that's why I have XLM, LTC, BTC, BCH, etc. here. And then scatter, this is actually doing the plot. So doing the point, the text is just putting the text, but the scatter is the method that we saw in the previous chapter that does a scatter plot. So scatter plot just means a plot with points, a plot with points. So, so that's why we have scatter. And you can see that mean return volatility. So that's the x-axis, that's the y-axis. And then the column here, this is also doing this display. The display of the column is because it's going to give this um, overall label in the chart, the legend of the chart. Anyway, so a bit more customizations. This is, I'm asking to show a grid. So this little grid that we see here, all these lines, just to kind of see by eye in what region of volatility of average written we see, we can see a bit better. And then there's also the two dashed lines to highlight where is the zero line, the zero line, and finally some nice labelings, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. So that was an analysis over the full data range that we have. Let's have a look at what happened, for example, this year. So let's do 2023. Let me run this. And what do we get? Well, things changed quite a lot. But what's interesting to see is that in terms of volatility, we do have a sort of constant here, something that doesn't change. BNB, Ethereum, and BTC are still on the lower end of the, of the volatility of all these coins. But we can see that now the, the return changed a lot. And it seems, well, I mean, not it seems, during we, we see that in terms of average return, the coin that performed the best is Bitcoin Cash but that was also the coin with the highest volatility. Okay, let's see, for example, what happened in 2022, which was a terrible year for cryptocurrencies, a, the, a big bear market where the prices just went down, down, down. So what do we see? Well, quite expect, we could have expected that. Because of this bear market, um, we see that the average returned 
are negative. And we do see still that BDC, BNB are on the lower end of volatility and still Ethereum as well, but you can see it's not the third, but probably the fourth highest here. Yeah, XLM came down here. And this time, the one that performed, although the average returns is the lowest, the one that performed the best is Ethereum. I uh, beg your pardon, Ethereum Classic, but also the one with the highest volatility. Okay, great. But now what I need to add with it here, well, actually, I'm going to put, put back the full range so we can see the total um, results. So what I want to add is that it is actually quite hard to know, to decide what coin is best to invest in, at least based on past data, because we're looking at past data here. Just always keep in mind that past performances never guarantee future results. But anyway, so what we can see here with this plot is, for example, it, is for it was for sure more interesting to buy BNB because BNB gives higher return for less risk for, because BNB has a lower volatility as re with respect to all these coins here. So BNB seems to be a better investment. On the same level, it's, it was way better. It is be better to, to invest in Ethereum rather than LINK because you get higher returns for lower volatility and the same with respect to these ones here. However, it's quite hard to say on the contrary, is it better to invest in Ethereum Classic versus Ethereum? Because Ethereum Classic gives a little extra average return, but for that you get much higher volatility. So is it worth to do take that extra risk, etc.? Could say the same. Is it really worth going towards Ethereum when I know that BTC has a lower volatility. So for that, we need to look into ratios, that some metrics that give you a better quantification of all of this. And the ratio I want to really bring your attention to is one that's really used wildly in finance, and that's the Sharpe ratio, because this is really a metric that gives you a quantification of the risk-reward ratio. And you can see that the Sharpe ratio is defined by the division of the average returns divided by the standard deviation of your of your returns. So the, the volatility that we, the standard deviation of the price, beg your pardon. So the volatility. So average returns divided by volatility times square root of N. The square root of N is because we want to compute the annualized Sharpe ratio. Okay, so let me copy this little code and then we can come and paste it here so we can run it. And I can, you can see that we are, you, you, well, actually, maybe you don't know, but this does correspond. Let's do the little computation of, if we do 365 times 24, that, that will give us how much? That will give us indeed 88,760. 8, so that's the number of hours in a year. And let's for, let's check how many, what is the length of the column of the columns in our data frame when we consider a year. So if I do length of PCT change and I'll do, let's do 2022 and I, I should do, I should pick the coin first. So let's do BTC, BTC, close the thingy. What have I done? I've forgotten one of these. And if I run this, okay, everything coincides well. Let me delete this, delete this. And so you can see simply Maybe I should re remind you of this, that with the power to the power um, 0.5 means to the square root. So that's why there's this double uh, star star, that's to the power in Python. Note that I'm indeed consider considering the DFPCT, so the percent change of the price on the price itself. And I'm doing indeed the mean divided by the standard deviation. And what do we see? Well, we see, for, inst for example, maybe we could have expected that, but that BNB is in, indeed the one that has the highest Sharpe ratio. I haven't mentioned, sorry, I should start by this, but something that's a good, considered to be a good investment is something that gives you a Sharpe ratio that's higher than one. Something between zero and one is a not so good investment and below zero, that means you're this investment, this strategy is losing money. So you should completely avoid it by all means. But between zero and one is telling you that the risk reward ratio is not worth it. In other words, the returns that you're getting are not worth the risk that you're going for. 
anyway. So I was saying BNB is the one that we have that has the highest Sharpe ratio. And that kind of makes sense with what we, we saw here. BNB was the one that was giving the highest average return, but was by far not the ones with the highest, the one with the highest risk. So that's what we, so that's kind of makes sense, right? We can also see that another one that has a very high Sharpe ratio is Ethereum. And again, we were seeing that that is on the higher end of average return, but you're not risking so much. The volatility is not that high. On the contrary, I think the smallest is Bitcoin Cash, which is actually here where it kind of also makes sense, right? We don't, we're not doing, so we're not doing very well in terms of average return, but we are on the higher end of the volatility. Well, let's say on average. But so that's that. Let me take this opportunity to also do a little nice plot. So let me copy this. That's the full code to do this nice little plot. Let me just add it here and then run it so we can discuss what we see. So this is a horizontal bar plot. So it kind of gives us a, a nicer representation of what we're seeing. So BNB, you see the highest sharp ratio up there, second, and it is ordered. So then the second best would, according to the sharp ratio, Ethereum, and we can see clearly that Bitcoin Cash is at the bottom. And BTC is around the middle with link. There we go. If you're curious about how we do the code, so at the beginning, we're doing a bit like a, a for loop over across all our cryptos makes sense. We are adding a list which computes the sharp ratio. Just a little um, note here, I'm converting the results in a data frame because then I can do a very easily do use this sort values. I think we've seen that before. So it just orders the the df the df sharp orders it nicely so then when i do the plot it is directly ordered from the highest to the lowest and then we are doing this plot you can see that i'm using i don't think we've seen that before we saw the vertical bar plot but here it is a horizontal bar plot so that's why we're doing we're using plat, matplotlib and we're using the the function called bar h for horizontal bar nice so there we go, an analysis with the sharp ratio. Now, the last metric I want to introduce today, and that which is something very important to analyze the risk of an investment or a strategy, and that's the to look into the maximum drawdown, which is basically you should understand it as the maximum loss a asset has done across time. So let me you understand better as we go. So let me first define a variable that I'm going to call running max. And actually, before that, let me put again the DF, let's say we'll be working on Bitcoin. So let's do DF of Bitcoin. And so we have it under our eyes. Actually, I could just put nicely this and we have, okay, everything here. So I want to keep track basically of all the, how the all time high of Bitcoin has evolved across time. So what I'm going to do is do df. I'm going to use a method call, called cum max for cumulative maximum. So let me also do then plot that running max. And what we said we would be working with Bitcoin. So I'll just put BTC here. Okay, Bitcoin. So we can see what happens. First line, well, by definition, there wasn't any line before. So the maximum at the all time maximum at that time here is this one itself. Then the next one, it changed as well because the next line, the price is higher than the previous one. Okay. But then here we see that from this line to this line, there was a decrease. So since we're tracking what is the all time high since then, well, it's keeping that numbers, that number before. And you can see that when we get towards the end, we get to the last lines, we have the top all time high for the last lines, which is uh, 68,633.69. Actually, if let me just add what we could do is we could check this in a different way. Well, let's just do print DF BTC maximum, and that should indeed give exactly this number. So is that what we get? Yes, it is. Great. So this is basically keeping track of the maximum value of our asset across time. But what I was wanting to compute is the maximum drawdown. So what is the maximum loss 
the asset has undergone. So you understand maybe from this, if I want to compute the maximum drawdown, I'll simply have to subtract this running max with respect to the price. So max, I'll just do max draw down. Let me write it properly. Great. Okay. So we it will be DF BTC. So the price minus the running maximum. And I'm interested in having a ratio or even better, a percentage. So I'll put running max again and then put a hundred percent. So let's run this and Okay, I didn't print anything. So let's do maximum drawdown here. And let's run this. And what do we get? Um, actually, let's do better than this because this you might not get an idea of, of what it means. So let's actually do a plot of this and, and even better than this, compare it with an other asset. So let's sim let me simply copy this code here and then come here and then put it and run it. There we go. I've hidden the code. How did I do that? I, I never do that generally. There we go. <laughs> okay. So again, so now just we've plotted. So here I'm plotting BTC, the maximum drawdown of BTC minus ETH. Here we've hidden a lot of values. So it's quite interesting to see that in the middle, um, we have even more than that. You can see that for Bitcoin, which is in blue, the worst maximum drawdown that they had is around 0.7, so 70%. I don't think I've put it in percent. Let's put it in percent so we keep the same scale. Okay, so we have in percent. So you can see that BTC had a maximum drawdown between 70%, which kind of, that makes sense. I mean, the price had went through bull runs, then bear markets, so it went high, and then it went down low. So you can see that the maximum loss was 70%. And what we see in this plot is that Ethereum is the one, it does have an even worse maximum drawdown, around 80%. But something interesting that you see as well here is that the correlation don't just, well, this is an implication, but we saw that those two coins are quite correlated, are correlated when it comes to returns, the evolution of a price, but also naturally when you look at the drawdown, de facto the drawdown is also going to be, is going to be correlated between those two assets. So you can see that they follow the same kind. So when one pumps, the other one pumps, but when one dumps, the other one dumps as well. So that's why we have here. Let's see, for example, maybe can change with, um, we could do XRP, for example, to compare what, what kind of drawdown does this give with respect to BTC. You can see that this, this XRP tend to have regions where there was a lot more drawdown in percentage in XRP as compared to BTC and tends to have a, a worse drawdown. Today was mostly a big application exercise where we've applied many of the concepts we've learned so far in this course. So I'm not going to give you a full homework practical exercise this time. You will find at the end of this written course on our website just a couple of suggestions to redo a plot for some plots, for example, where you use this time the maximum drawdown. But rather, I want to encourage you to work on your own projects. With today's analysis, you really have a solid foundation to conduct your own financial investigations. So probably you should be working on some data sets that interest you. I really can't stress this enough. If you want to progress in coding, practice is key. And don't forget that nowadays you have some really powerful tools like AI, like ChatGPT that can really help you with your coding. So do your own thing, get out there, and I'll see you in the next chapter. Take care.